And uh, good evening to everyone here at the chapel and on Zoom. Uh, let's just uh, commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Dear God and Father, we thank you, Lord, for having the freedom to gather and to, to assemble on Zoom too, Lord, to uh, just look into your word. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, communicate to us uh, your presence and uh, the wonder of your love and um, the wonder of your encouragement, Lord, um, through this uh, messianic psalm that we're going to talk about. I mean, you are so ever present in our lives that, that no matter what the situation is, and we thank you so much for people who have walked through um, hard times and grief, and uh, yet you have brought them through it and uh, you have restored them. And we thank you so much for that. And we just uh, would pray that you would just minister to our hearts now, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's uh, turn to Psalm 69. That's the, the responsibility for tonight. Um, I think what I'm going to do here, though, is I'm going to I'm going to get you to turn to Psalm 69, and then I'm going to turn to three references and uh, two references in John and one in Matthew. These three references are quoted in this psalm, and um, we're just going to read them, and it kind of gives a little summary, basically, of the chapter. And um, so it's kind of neat to read how the Lord Jesus uh, and, and situations in the New Testament brought these verses uh, into the context in the New Testament. So John 2, hold your finger at Psalm 69. We're going to look at John 2, verse 17. John 2, verse 17. So <clears throat> we'll read this one first. And we'll just start at verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And so this was a significant event. And how often he went up, and then at the one time he he actually, um, uh, you know, was the fulfillment of the Passover. But this is another instant here, very important nonetheless. And I just look at the treatment there that they they had of this day. He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written. So they're remembering from Psalm 69, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. And the actions of what the Lord had done um, was, was an example to the uh, disciples. And they remembered uh, the passion and the zeal that he had for the things of the Lord. Let's look at John 15, the second verse that's uh, directly mentioned in Psalm 69. We have it here in John 15, verse 25. And I think we'll start off at verse 18 for context. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep they will keep yours also. But all these things they do they will do uh, to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the world might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And so to know the Lord Jesus is to, to know yourself and the sin and uh, how this uh, helps us to, to align ourselves properly. But those sometimes... Uh, react to, to God highlighting sin in a negative way. They, they, they just get uh, hateful of God or anything that would shine a light upon their lives to, to convince them or convict them of sin. And so there's a hatred there. You haven't really done anything, but the Lord had this happen to him. They hated me without a cause. The third uh, one I'd like to, to read is in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 7, in reaction to that person who had as his life motive a zeal for the Father's house, 
was hated without a cause. In the end, he was treated this way. What did they do to uh, quench that grief? What did they do to satisfy the grief of the Lord Jesus in, in Matthew 27, verse 34? It says here, when he's um, <clears throat> on the way to the cross, on the way to Golgotha, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. And so we see here the third verse quoted in Psalm 69. These three verses here sort of uh, summarize Psalm 69 for us. Um, David was the one who went through grief uh, in this uh, psalm, and um, he experienced some of the similar things. He experienced uh, a life for God, uh, a life that he was trying to please God with, and he also experienced hatred without a cause. Sometimes we are hated because we, we have a cause of that hatred, but um, really, he's living his life in such a way that he doesn't understand why they hate me. It's probably just because they, he represented God. It shone the light on the people around him and convicted them of sin. But he was living this life for God, but he was hated without a cause. And then in the end, too, he wasn't really, uh, you know, treated too well by those that hated him. And they just kind of heaped insult upon insult, as it were. And um, I guess we're getting a little bit of a, a warning sign here. Okay, there we go. I think we all got that on our cell phones, excuse me. And uh, so they, they gave him in verse 21 and 69, they also gave me gall for my food. Gall was a poisonous herb, a poisonous plant. This is what they did to satisfy the grief of David at this instance and the Lord. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. I don't know about you, but I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't be the household vinegar that we would have today, but it still would not be quenching at all. Uh, you would resist it. And at the point of maximal thirst, uh, this is how the people around the Lord treated him, and is also how the people around David at this time treated him. So Psalm 69 is about David suffering pressure and reproach, and it uh, looks forward to when Christ suffered reproach and pressure uh, in his life as well. 73 out of 150 Psalms were written by David, 25, I'm told, were messianic. They go beyond the author, and they go to uh, speak of Christ in this way. Sometimes people would define messianic psalms as, uh, you know, if you find the verse in the New Testament, it's indeed messianic. But that doesn't apply to Psalm 24, 72, and 89. So I think sometimes you just look at the way that the verses are written and the character of the verses represent or speak of the Lord Jesus, not necessarily being an implicit uh, implicitly uh, quoted in the New Testament. But I kind of just like uh, the Messianic Psalms and that whole thought about the Lord coming alongside, isn't it? I mean, here's David going through this uh, circumstance in his life, extreme grief, and uh, he doesn't know that, that these verses would be quoted in a future day, but I would have to think that he sensed some presence of God very close to his heart. And then I think about the Lord Jesus, too, and the comfort of the Scriptures in his life. When the going got tough, the scriptures came to him and he says, I'm going through this in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. And through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we're to, to comfort ourselves in Romans. Doesn't it say that? And Christ, when he lived his life, the comfort of the scriptures came to his life. And I, I like that parallel that often exists in the Messianic Psalms. In the title of the Psalm 69, it says here, to the chief musician in my Bible, sent to the lilies, and I just looked up this here, is that lilies is a symbol of tenderness, of purity, beauty, and joy. Sometimes it could mean maybe that it was a, a tune to be uh, sung, uh, the psalm was to be sung by a certain tune. Um, another thought that I read was this, is that in Psalm 45 it mentions the lilies. It mentions the glory of the lilies as grown from a, an ivory palace, as some context that was so suited for growth. You would think that, you know what, if anything is going to grow in that garden, it's going to be that great garden there. You put down some good uh, soil and you put, the, you put water down, you put fertilizer down. Surely to goodness, that plant will grow there. And the lilies is coming out of Psalm 45. is like that. But the lilies referred to here in Psalm 69 are growing from a most unlikely place. It's, it's growing from the mire. It's growing, go, growing from a circumstance that you would not think growth could be possible. And uh, in, in situations in our life where growth seems impossible, the Lord would like to grow something. He'd like to make things real to us. He likes to come and visit us 
in those times where growth seems the most hardest. And so the lily of the valley here in Psalm 69 is mentioned. Psalm 69 is the lily of the valley. In the valley uh, of the shadow of death or in the valley of our sufferings, lilies still grow. And the beauty of the lily is seen here as well. Let's look at the experience then that could happen, some characteristics of our experience as we suffer. <clears throat> we'll just uh, read the first few verses here. Save me, O God, in verse 1, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me... Uh, without a cause or more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. So you put yourself in this context here. And um, you think about being hated without a cause. You think about um, something slowly happening to you, as in verse 1, the waters are coming up to your neck. Obviously, we like water. Water is good. We're 80% water, our bodies. But water in the lungs is not good. So you think of this water creeping up to a spot where it's going to take your life. And uh, <clears throat> I like to think that it's a spiritual application here, a spiritual life that's about to be zapped from David. The waters are slowly creeping up to the point where he's going to find a heart. He's going to suffocate. And that life within him is going to suffocate. It could also mean, too, that in an experience of this in verse 2, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. Have you ever been in that situation? Where there is no standing this past week i was in the in the gonquin park and we were trying to just experiment probably being uh, uh, idiots in a way but we we were trying to experiment with canoes actually it was a nice day so we thought well, let's see what these canoes can do so we flipped them and we submerged them and there was two canoes and we had to get in order to get one canoe up over the other we had to go underneath break the seal of the canoe and then turn it over and uh, I was on one end, but the canoe drove me right down, and, and I, I couldn't get footing. I mean, we're 30 feet of water or so. And it was quite a thing to not have that footing, to sink and not have that footing. And sometimes emotionally, maybe, we might uh, reach the same point in life, where there doesn't seem to be an anchor. And we go through some tough times, and there is no standing. So it might be this type of experience. It might be something that hits you suddenly. And, you know, you, you just feel like, I just don't have anything more. I can't possibly get a footing, get a foothold on, on things. I can't get any foundation. And so the floods overflow him. He's weary with his crying. His throat is dry. Spiritual life dried up. Now, in, in the end of verse 3, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. It's a very spiritual um, experience here, I, I, I feel. He hasn't lost his faith. Although a lot of things are going away, a lot of things are being sapped, uh, you know, that would give him life and, and sustain him, he still doesn't lose that uh, hope in waiting for God. His eyes fail. His eyes keep opened for God, waiting, waiting, waiting. But as he's even finding that that's failing uh, in his life as well. But uh, he's remaining hopeful that God will visit him. When you go through these uh, different experiences, um, I, when I was preparing for this um, message tonight, I couldn't get past the first four verses, save me, O God. I think as Christians, um, we, we remember the day when we got saved from sin and that glorious time when we converted from death to life and, and, and how the conviction of the Holy Spirit was there for us and we gave our lives to Christ and, and we just thought, you know, that was the greatest thing and uh, the salvation of God is magnificent. Uh, but I think that same power of salvation is needed everyday life in a Christian. That same uh, circumstance that we need saving from is still there. We still need him as much as, as we ever needed him. And I couldn't get by the first four verses in this chapter. Save me, O God. I was finding myself as I came to different thoughts in my life and different circumstances in my life, I thought, save me, O God. <laughs> save me, O God. Disillusionment. You know, why are they hating me? They're hating me without a cause. I'm doing all these things for Christ, and they hate me without a cause. Disillusionment, discouragement, drying up of a spiritual life. You have Jesus in you, the Holy Spirit in you. Sometimes still, that drying up can happen in some ways. And you're saying, save me, O oh God. Temptation of just disbelief. Temptation to leave God. Temptation to sin. 
David is, is, is very cognizant of his sin in verse 5. Oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Foolishness are those light sins maybe that happen in our life, and the secret ones that we go to automatically when we know that maybe not even God is watching. But then the sins there in the second part of the verse are the greater ones. But he's, he's totally cognizant of his sin at this time as well, when he's under grief and stress. And he's saying, save me, O oh God, from this. And, and also, just save me from myself. <laughs> How many times do I get in the way of what God is trying to do with me uh, in, in some other capacity? And, or, or just the way I'm like? Um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, other people can see things about the way I'm like that just I don't see. And, and, and oftentimes, you know, just save me, Lord. Save me, O oh God, from myself. And, um, and I had a hard time getting beyond the first four words of this psalm. But we need that salvation still today as Christians. And uh, God is still able to come down and save us for that. So as we, as, uh, we go into the middle of so verses 6 to uh, verse 12, we see that here is, here is um, David very cognizant of his life before people and his, his, his example of, uh, of living for God. He says in verse 6, Let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Uh, he doesn't want to do anything that's going to bring Christ or bring God rather into uh, question. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Even though he's dire and distress, he's, he's, he's cognizant of, of what his life looks like in front of others. Be, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face in verse 7. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. That's one that hurts, doesn't it? And I haven't experienced that. But there's some maybe here tonight who have experienced confessing Christ in their family has meant that they have to leave their family. And we know that the Lord Jesus was not believed within his own family. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, it's devoured me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, he's going to a spiritual exercise here, that became my reproach. It was shame. It was seen as shame. I also made sackcloth my garment, and so mourning me <clears throat> became a byword to them. And just a, a kind of a, a little bit of a lack, laughing stalker, they tagged him with a nickname that wasn't really nice. In verse 12, it says, Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. Those who would be very capable people in the city spoke against him, and those also who were drunk and nothing else to do in life made a song about him. And so he was saying, probably, I'm living for God. Uh, the zeal of your house has eaten me up, but no one seems to be listening. So he comes to this spot here in verse 13. He says, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. In the acceptable time means that it's favorable. Going to God is favorable in all circumstances. And, and, and David comes to realize this. In his, in his extreme distress, in his uh, disillusionment, maybe, that people, in the way that people are treating him, he comes to the point where he says, you know, it's just you and me, God, and I'm, on, I'm coming before you, O oh Lord, and I'm gonna, I, I know it's the favorable time to come before you and pray. Sometimes we're discouraged. Sometimes we don't see the invitation to come before God. No, it's too great, God, or it's overwhel too overwhelming, God, for you to be part of this situation right now. Or the weakness that I succumb to all along in sin, um, it's just, no, it, I just don't want to go and, and be before God at this time. But David here shows us that he uh, comes before God and he knows that before God is the acceptable time always to come before him. One of the ways that he, he, he grows his prayer, he grows his faith, is to immerse his prayer in the soil of the multitude of God's mercy, in the multitude of God's mercy. And uh, sometimes I think that, you know, not only is God's mercies um, multiple and uh, uh, various and deep and, and everlasting, 
and new every morning, I think they're tailored sometimes to each of us. I don't have a scripture right now to support that, but I do think that, you know, God knows each individual here, each individual Christian, weaknesses uh, inside and tendencies that we have, and I think, you know, he has a special mercy, it says in the hymn, for each hour. And he, and he comes to us, and, 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 and we just will appeal and uh, solicit that mercy of God that's been written just for us. And that's where the growth starts. We have no other place. We come and, and we start in the multitude of the mercy of God. And um, we appeal to him, hear me, O God, when it's time maybe that you think God is not listening. Hear me, O God, in the truth of your salvation. He is able to save. And that salvation happens every day of our life. And uh, it's the truth of his salvation. He has promised salvation from these things. And with time, he will deliver me, in verse 14, out of the mire and let me not sink. So as we, we look at uh, the, the prayer more deeply here, we see a few ingredients of this prayer. Uh, in verse 16, it starts off, Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. And again, it's an appeal for God to hear. Sometimes we just think that maybe God is not hearing. But it says, hear me, O Lord, for I know your loving kindness is good. You, when, you, when you act on your loving kindness, you can't help but hear me. And it says, turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. We think God sometimes is turned away from us in some instances. And we're asking the Lord to turn to us. Do not hide your face from your servant. And hear me speedily. He's asking for the Lord to come in a hurried way. That word speedily here might be defined in your Bible, depending on your translation, as in a hurry. God, come in a hurry to me and, 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 and be in my presence. And draw near to my soul, in verse 18, and redeem it. Here it is again, the idea of salvation. Redeem it from this time. Redeem it from this disillusionment. Redeem it from the discouragement I see around me. Redeem it from the temptation to just be uh, myself. And, and, you know, it says, in all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your paths. Um, so we do that despite us. We, we're saved from ourselves. Redeem the soul again uh, and deliver me because of my enemies in verse 18. Um, in verse 19, it says, you know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. You know all this stuff that I'm going through, O oh God. My adversaries are all before you. What a comfort that would be. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I look for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Um, they also gave me gall for my food, my thirst. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. <clears throat> and then they have the, the, the reaction of those uh, around uh, David at this time, verse 22, um, let their table become a snare for them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened. This rather story is, is uh, David speaking here. Um, some commentators would say that, you know, I mean, indeed David is asking for vengeance uh, here on these enemies of his. And the Lord Jesus in that time of the garden and everything else, he didn't ask for vengeance. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So there is a contrast uh, here in some ways with the way David reacted to the enemies and the way the Lord reacted to his enemies, but he says in verse 22, let their success or let their table become a snare for them. They are so high and mighty and successful. Let it become a snare for them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see. Make their loins shake continuously. Um, pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them and um, let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents. Verse 26, for they, have, for they pers persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. These two phrases here caught my eye this week in verse 26. For they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. So that means the enemies are coming along. Now, now God has a hand in this. David sees God's hand in the persecution. Even though the persecution comes at the hands of others, enemies around him, uh, David sees that God's hand is behind it all. Uh, he says, you have struck, um, you have wounded. But these enemies come in there and they say, aha, you know, you're suppressed, you're discouraged, and then they just heap it on all the more. Where David looks through this and he sees that 
you know, the hand of God is behind this. And even though there's some hard circumstances to go through, um, God's hand is behind it. That's what I think anyways, that these verses are saying, this verse is saying. Um, and then David just pronounces, you know, add iniquity in verse 27 to their iniquity and, and so on and so forth. Blot them out of the book of the living in, in, in verse 28. But we see here the, the humble approach, again, is what triumphs. Um, David says he's sorrowful, he's poor in spirit in verse 29. And he says, let your salvation, here we come again, the salvation of God coming to his heart at this time. He's already a believer, but it's coming to him again. And it's lifting him up high above all the troubles. High above all the troubles. Um, sometimes if you have a good experience with the plane, I know Brian and Nancy have had some recently difficult experiences, but I like it when you come off the, the plane, off the tarmac, and you and you, you ascend above what's going on down below. I love that. And, uh, you know, you, you just came from that area, all the hustle and bustle, and all of a sudden you take off, and the wheels lift off the tarmac, and you're set up on high above the troubles, and you go across, uh, even above the clouds, through the storms. You might, you might even fly through a storm. Uh, but I love that perspective that God gives David here. Set me up on high in verse 29. Also, too, he, 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 he releases his mouth with a song. I will, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. He's promoting. Magnify means promote, to expand on God. Now he wants to speak highly of God going through things for God and his life lived for God and, and really not being treated well, while well, he says, you know, no, I'm going to continue to magnify him. And you know what else happened in verse 31? His worship became, went from a form to reality. He knew what the law said. Go get yourself a mature ox or bull with horns and hooves on it and sacrifice that. He knew the law, but he knew that really his worship was maybe, could be better. I will just say that, could be better. Um, it says, uh, this also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull, which has horns and hooves. And his worship from his heart became all the more real, separated from the law. Now, uh, the law was, so to speak, written on his heart, and he praised God and worshiped God for it. The humility of of, of of this was his success. The humility of his action before God was the success and, and a real rejuvenation of his worship. And also verse 32, um, what did David need the most? He, he, most? he needs saving from a life that seemed to be sucked dry and discouragement. It says here, the humble shall see this and be glad. The humble shall see this and be glad. It means to brighten up. It means to cheer up. That's what glad means there. And you who seek God, your heart shall live. And so that word there means to revive, to nourish, to recover, to repair, to restore, and then finally to save. He's still in saving this heart. He's saving this discouraged heart. You who seek God, never stop seeking God, and your heart shall live. And, and what a... What a, what a circumstance here he was brought through. Uh, for the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Another, another little sort of reference, his prisoners, really. Who, who, who are we? Are we prisoners of the Lord? Um, I think we are prisoners of the Lord. Uh, some, someone else might think that we're in, we're in prison to them. But really, he says here, does not despise his prisoners and those that are uh, persecuted for his name's sake. And then what happens to David's eyes becomes universal. And they let heaven and earth praise him that sees and everything, the seas and everything that moves in them. He becomes uh, not so narrow in his sight. He becomes broad and sees how God will universally be praised. And God will set a physical setting of Zion in the earth, in the earth which is inhabited with so much opposition. In verse 35, God will save Zion, build the cities of Judah, and that they may dwell there and possess it. And then also a generational attachment here. It's not going to be over when someone dies, as descendants of its servants shall inherit it. And those who love his name shall dwell in it. And so we're brought from through an experience of some, some, a man in his life. Uh, this was apparently towards the end of David's life, but he, he starts off, you know, in the first verses there, 
of um, being in stress, being in deep mire, no standing, uh, dryness. He's brought through a prayer where he just looks for God and he's restored at the end of it. That's often our experience, isn't it? We go through these things and, um, you know, the Lord Jesus in his life quoted these three verses and brought this forward into the New Testament uh, because what we go through, he's also gone through and we can be encouraged in that. Um, and that's all we have for tonight.